What? I'm sitting. I'm sitting. Who has a Bible? Let's look <laughs> I, up. I have a Bible. Let's look up Revelation 8 and 1. Did you all know that women were going to get to heaven <laughs> and power to make men? Did you know that? Got it. <laughs> All right, here we go. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> stimulating each other and fellowshipping and growing in the Lord. We just rejoice in this church and the leadership. We just rejoice in the work you're doing. Thank you for this next hour and we commit to you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Denise did us a big favor. She brought some of the resources uh, that we use in counseling fairly regularly and I'm just going to show a few of these to you. I was talking to Steve and Cheryl last night actually about the uh, situation that I described going, you know, in my first session about the lady with had all the miscarriages and et cetera, and was telling them that when I was meeting with her, I was spending sometimes six to seven hours a week preparing to meet with her because the situation was so complex and I was so wet behind the ears. So. Um, he thought it might be helpful for you guys to know that sometimes preparing to meet with people is hard work. And uh, just the process of learning and understanding things uh, was really tough. And I hadn't been through any training like this, so none of the things that we're going to cover in the third weekend were really part of my ministry toolbox. So I was learning a lot of things just really from scratch. And... And that's often the way it is. So people will come in and you'll talk with them and they'll begin to share things and, you, and you, you won't really know how to address it. So you can help them maybe with some things and say, let me look into that. For instance, when she came and said, I'm having hallucinations, I was kind of freaking out. Hallucinations, this lady's demon possessed. I don't even know what's going on. And uh, so I had never done any reading ever about hallucinations or what causes them or what might cause them, et cetera. Now I'm starting to wonder if she did really have an organic problem and uh, didn't really know how to think about it. Did some reading, found out people with sleep loss often have hallucinations. And so when she came back the next week, I asked her, have you been sleeping? No, I hardly ever sleep. Can't remember the last time I got more than two hours of sleep at a time. Oh. <laughs> So we, you know, we reasoned through it and her hallucinations went away just by learning how to get some sleep and taking care of herself and whatnot. So it just took a lot of reading to sort through stuff like that. So um, we were talking about the past and how some of the secular models of, of counseling rely heavily on that. Here are two good resources, same author, one shorter, that's a lot shorter than this one, right? So depending on how deeply the problems with their past run, but this one's called Redeeming Your Painful Past. And this one's called Putting Your Past in Its Place, Moving Forward in Freedom and Forgiveness. Good tools for people who come in and just don't know how to think about their past, whether they're past abuses or past uh, trials that they haven't responded to well. You begin to talk with them, you realize they need help thinking through what God's perspective is on those things. These are some good resources. Uh, Steve. Viers or Stephen, it says, v, v as in victory over our sin, I-A-R-S, Viers. Uh, he's a pastor at uh, Faith Baptist Church in Lafayette, Indiana, which uh, I think Fred uh, mentioned yesterday. And that church is a great resource on your website. 
Then this is a helpful little book called Christ and Your Problems. Uh, you know, often people just think, uh, uh, well, you just, you just don't understand. That's, that's a common thing that you'll hear. You, you start to try to help people, try to talk through them. You just don't understand. Uh, he goes through 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no trial that has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. There's, there are common threads with all the problems that men face. And helping people see those common threads are helpful in how to respond to them. Um, and this is really helpful to encourage and motivate people to do the hard work of growth and change. So it's really good. The Bookends of the Christian Life uh, by Jerry Bridges and Bob Bevington is, is really a helpful little book on uh, the basics of Christian living. It really has bookends. The two bookends that he's talking about are the righteousness of Christ, which is all that Romans 6 type of truth that we talked about earlier. And the other bookend is the power of the Holy Spirit. And he talks about uh, what we talked about, that uh, the Holy Spirit is at work to energize our disciplined effort at growth and change. And so he does a really good job explaining that dynamic. And it's, uh, it's just actually a great book for discipleship as well as, as counseling. I mentioned this one last night. Quick scripture reference for counseling uh, by John Cruz, K-R-U-I-S. Um, this is just really a topical Bible arranged by counseling topics. So adultery, affliction, alcohol, anger, anxiety, contentment, uh, drug abuse, friendships, uh, laziness, etc. All kinds of topical issues. There's maybe a hundred or so topical issues where he just, it's, it's all just scripture. And he just lists passages of scripture. K-R-U-I-S, John Cruz, quick scripture reference for counseling. So I, I, as soon as I find mine in the boxes I haven't unpacked yet, this will sit on my desk. It always, it's always just sat right on my desk because um, it's a good, quick scripture reference. You got to have a tool bag. Yeah. Put these kinds of things in your tool bag. So we'll we'll uh, so set these aside. We'll talk about those at the beginning of the next Later. session. Yep. Is that so. what you're going to print out for us? Yes. Yes. Yep. Those those resources eventually will end up on a bibliography that we'll bring and uh, and We're give to you. We're trying to put these in our church library also. So I don't know if you've got a library. Put it in Jim's library, and then you can bug him. <laughs> well, turn to page thirty in your syllabus and uh, you'll see there the page getting to heart issues. If you grab your tab and go to the very end of weekend one, if you haven't thumbed through this already, you'll see this same chart without the headers and the footers and with, and with some blanks, okay? Don't fill that in. We're giving that to you as a tool it's something that you can actually walk through with somebody to help them understand the, the heart issues or to think through how to understand heart issues. Uh, the one we have at the beginning on page 30 is all filled in. And there's different ways of doing this. I actually have not. I, I built this tool uh, just a couple weeks ago um, for you all and thought, wow, well, I should have done this a long time ago. I've always just kind of done it freehand and off the top of my head. So. Uh, put a little more thought into it and uh, put it together for uh, this, this class. What people need to understand is uh, that the issues of life come out of our hearts. So um, I would sit down, if, if I'm, I could be doing it on a whiteboard, I'm not always in my office, so I don't always have a whiteboard. So I might even prefer just to sit at the desk or the table with someone and get out a blank sheet of paper and start building this from scratch. Um, so you might want to do it that way too. That's how I've always done it in the past. And then if I did it on paper, I would just give it to them. So they have it as a, a reference just to uh, learn from. So, uh, but uh, our hearts are at the center of who we are. So you'll see there Psalm 139. Um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we do this? 
if, uh, well, we want to get this on tape, so uh, I'll try to turn to these as fast as I can. Psalm 139, verse 23, at the bottom there. I won't put all the pieces on the board. That'll be make it a little quicker. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. The psalmist wants the Lord to reach down deep into his heart because it's out of the heart that everything comes. That is what Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts and murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault, witness, slanders. These are the things which defile a man. And they all come out of the heart. The Bible uses the, the term heart uh, synonymously, really, with the inner man. So uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks as a man thinks in his heart. So is he, uh, the heart is what thinks, the heart is what uh, desires, right? The heart is what acts, it chooses, our will, our volition is tied to the heart, um, intentions and attitudes tied to our hearts, our goals, our motives tied to our hearts. So as you read through the scripture, heart is mentioned how many times, Fred? I think it's close to a thousand. Close. I know it's at least 800. Yeah. So people need to understand that what the Bible refer to, refers to as the heart includes all of these things. Right? So if you're trying to help them uh, work on how they think or work on what they desire or work on why they do what they do, why they choose what they choose, Right? Helping them see that that's coming out of the heart. That's coming out of that part of your being that the Bible describes as your heart. Okay? So what we need to do is make sure that the heart is being and expressing everything that God has designed it to be. And this is what is true about the Christian. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. All things have become new. That's who we are to be as Christians. That's what God has recreated us to be. That's uh, Romans 6 truth, really. It's a similar thing that we are di we've, we've, we've died to sin. We've been freed from sin's slavery. That's who we are. We're new creatures. And... Uh, look at Romans 8.2, also on the left side of the diagram. The, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Turn to Ephesians 4. Where Paul says, Put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So that's the, these are the, the, the new creation language here. The free from sin language, new creature. Uh, so helping people see this is who you are. This is who God has created you to be. This is how you must live, right? If we want all of these things to be what God desires them to be. So how does that happen? Well, influence of the Spirit is how that happens, right? Having a gospel focus is how that happens. So we're thinking, uh, learning, growing, and our understanding of who God is, who we are, what we have in Christ Jesus, what He desires us to be. We're Doing what Colossians says, right? Letting the word of Christ richly dwell within us. Um, we're letting uh, the gospel influence us. The gospel that says, you know what? This is really good news. How good? You've been freed from sin. You're a new creature. Old things pass away. New things have come, right? We're letting those ideas 
All of these ideas influence right, our hearts. That's our goal. That's what we're trying to help people understand. That's what we're, what we're aiming at. Unfortunately, we don't always do that like we should, right? So we have the influence of the flesh. We talked about those four characteristics of the flesh. The flesh is, is, uh, is powerful. It doesn't give up easily. Um, turn to Romans 7. Paul said, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is, in my flesh, in that unredeemed part of my existence. There's nothing good. The redeemed part is, is good. The unredeemed part, that is my flesh, there's nothing good. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So he's saying I, the willing is there, but this influences me to not do it all the time. That's his experience. For the good that I want, I do not do. I practice the very evil that I do not want, but I'm doing the very thing I do not want. It's no longer, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. That happens when we allow the flesh to influence us more than we allow the truth, the spirit, to influence and, and enable us, right? So that's basically what's happening. We're giving in to the corruption of our flesh. We're listening to that dead man who's strapped to our back, lying and whispering into our ears, telling us, you must obey me. Do it. You'll like it. Try it. You'll like it. Remember that commercial? <laughs> All right. Mikey. Uh, so... Turn again to Ephesians chapter 4. Maybe you haven't turned the page yet. Because Ephesians 4.22 reminds us that this, this, is, this is a battle. When he says, in reference to your former manner of life. So that's the deal. We're, we're running away from that. That's what we're trying to put off. In reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. So notice, this is how the Bible talks about our sin. Why, is, why does the Bible talk about our sin today as a Christian, as our former manner of life? Do you ever think about that? Because it's not who you are. Right? It's not who God has created you to be. So he says, in reference to that former manner of life, lay aside the old self. If you don't, this can still exercise influence. Notice what he says, lay aside that old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. You let the sinful desires of the flesh corrupt you, corrupt your flesh. That, that would be an ongoing process if you let it continue to happen. He says, don't, don't let it continue to happen. That's not who you are. That's not who God has recreated you to be. So let's lay that aside. Put it off, right? Put it off. So helping people see there's this constant struggle, constant battle. Uh, ultimately, all of these things, our thoughts, our, our desires, our motives, our goals, our intentions, our attitudes, they all come out of us eventually, and we hit this point of decision, right? And that point of decision comes, flows out of all of this. It flows out of all of this, right? And we know what this feels like sometimes. It feels just like my son did in his bedroom that one night. Right? Why? Why do I know you're right, but I don't want to listen to you? It's Galatians 5.17. The spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. So we're the ones that are supposed to glory in Christ Jesus, circumcised heart, put no confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3 something. Right? No confidence in the flesh. Romans 13.14. Uh, make no provision for the flesh. See, when we make provision for the flesh, when we 
put confidence in our flesh, then we allow this side of the thing to, to let the former manner of life influence our heart, and we lose this battle. We lose this battle. But if we let the influence of the Spirit, our understanding of the gospel, the realities of who we are in Christ, right, exercise that influence on us, when that point of decision comes, we win that battle. So, you know, when you, when you, when you talk about being in the Word every day and just exercising basic Christian disciplines, reading the Scriptures and praying, uh, don't ever let your counseling become take two Bible verses and call me in the morning. Please don't do that. But that's really good advice. To be in the Word every day, to be filling your mind with, why does Paul say, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you? And then say, be filled with the Spirit. Because those two things, are they're, they're virtually synonymous, right? Virtually synonymous. I think one acts more in the mind, one acts more in the will, perhaps, but virtually synonymous. That's why we have to control, as much as we can, all of the thoughts and desires and motives and thinking that happens below this line. Now, I do that horizontal line to, to recognize that we've got the thinking. It's all going to flow out of here, depending on where the influences are coming and whether or not we're going to say, I'm going to live like the old man or according to the old man, I'm going to live according to my former manner of life or I'm going to be the new self that God has created me to be. It happens right here. Which, which one? That thinking, it's going to come, right? It's going to come. And what are we going to do? So everything that happens down here is inner man stuff. That's why the heart is below the line. So on the diagram, you see where it says inner man. And I'm, I'm intending it to be everything that happens below that line is the inner man. It's who we are. That's who we're allowing ourselves to be. It's who we're allowing our heart to be influenced by. That's all taking place in the inner man, right? So that point of decision and the point of showing that point of decision right there on the line is to remind us that every choice we make flows out of what is happening and what we're allowing to influence and happen below the line in our inner man, right? It all comes out of the heart. Then it comes out, right? It comes out. It comes out in our words. It comes out in our actions. Eventually, what is in our hearts come out, right? At that point of decision, for out of the heart come, right? All kinds of stuff. The bad stuff and the good stuff comes out of the heart. This point of decision, as it says right there, is, is, it's a hard one. And it's a hard choice, like it was for my son, like it is for all of us on a regular basis, to grit our teeth and say, I'm going, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. And I'm going to think the way God tells me to think. I'm going to submit to my father, even though in that part of me that's unredeemed, it's resisting. But I know what is right, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to make that hard choice. For the sake of the glory of God and the worship of my Savior, I am going to make that hard choice. Right? And he, he grits his teeth, and I grit my teeth. We've all done it, and we choose to please God. Right? We make the hard decision to choose to please God, and it is hard. How is he making that? This is what people need to understand. There is truth, and there is biblical principle that is defining and informing that thing. So the, the influence of the Spirit, the focus of the gospel, it's truth. It's biblical principle. We're saying, I'm going to do what I know is right. I'm going to do and think and pursue and love what God tells me is right. I need to live my life truth-based, principle-based. Right Now, what's easy or easier at the point of decision is to please ourself. And so many people that come and they want help they are living life out here, and they're not letting their thinking, and they're not letting their choices, and they're not letting their desires and their goals be defined by truth and principle. They're just driven by their feelings, and they're, they're, they're driven by their emotions and their desires, right? And, they're, and they're, it's so easy just to let these rule the day, right? 
And there's, there's my son. He wants to not listen to me. He really, I mean, you can see it on his face. He's like, Argh. right? But he knows what is right. So what is he going to do? Is he going to just explode? Is he going to just explode and tear me to pieces verbally, which is what he wanted to do? Is he going to be driven by his feelings, by his desires right there? To, I want to be a man. I'm 17 years old. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to show my dad what's on my iPod, right? Or is he going to say, no, I want to love God. I want to be accountable. I want to be holy. God says, submit. I'm going to decide this on truth. What are we going to do? Now, in a, in a case like, like his, it's, uh, it's a little bit simpler. In a case like someone who's uh, struggling with, you know, a man who's struggling with porn addiction or uh, a woman who's struggling with it, for that matter, with Fifty Shades of Grey uh, screaming at us every time we uh, turn on the television. Um, those are the things that, that fuel and feed desires, right? They fuel and feed our desires, and where is that coming from? Uh, it's so easy to make those decisions. What ends up happening, though, and this is what you want to help the people who come to you for help to understand. Look, influence, feed the right things so that these decisions are based on truth and principle, not feelings and desires. But part of what God does is he, he motivates us by promise, uh, he motivates us by warning. So he gives us both warnings and promises. If we choose to, to neglect truth and principle and make decisions based on feelings and desires and the influence of the flesh, right? What does Galatians 6 tell us is going to happen? The one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life, which not only means life forever, it's a quality of life as much as it is a, a time of life. Proverbs 13, 15 says, I think it says, the way of the transgressor is hard. How's it go, Fred? I think that's right. I think that's right. Good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. So you see the, you see the contrast there, right? I want to be over here. I want God's favor, right? Understanding brings favor. This brings corruption, Galatians says. Hard life, Proverbs says, right? Hebrews 12 we're talking about the life of a believer here. So, Hebrews 12 reminds us you, because it, it is, it is hard <laughs> to make this decision sometimes, right? We all wish every act of obedience was easy, don't we? Uh, and I think sometimes we, we only choose to do right, follow the right way when it is easy. If it was easy, it wouldn't be a war, right? So what does Hebrews remind us? Verse 4, chapter 12. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. All this stuff that's hard, these hard choices, they have a purpose. Don't faint when you're reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Um, so that's what's going to happen. If you don't resist to the point of shedding your blood and you regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, you're going to end up over here, right? And it's going to be hard. You're going to get disciplined and scourging. And it's not going to seem good. It's not going to seem pleasant. Uh, I think he says later, right? How does he say it? Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, right? Is that what you want? None of us want that. Sorrow, 
right? Pain. It's painful. It's a painful experience for the Christian, but that's what's going to come if we let feelings and desires and these influences affect that decision up that that's what we're going to get. That's what, so there's the warnings. God gives us the warnings. But the opposite is also true. Right? We saw good understanding brings favor. Or Matthew 11. I think that's the come unto me, isn't it? Yeah, 28. Yeah. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Rest, easy, light. Those are good words. Right? We come unto him, we do what is right, even though it might be hard. It's a yoke, right? He's still saying it's a yoke, but the yoke fits because it's fitted for us. That's the idea. So um, Romans 2, actually you could use Romans 2 for both sides of the equation, although Paul is really talking about the depravity of man in general. He reminds us that God's economy includes both warning and promise. Warning for those who don't do right, promise for those who do. Verse 7, those who by perseverance in doing good Seek for glory and honor and immortality. They get eternal life. Verse 10, glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there's, there's peace. Oh, that's another good word, right? You just say blessing. I, I mean, you can put any of those words in there uh, that are already on the diagram. Joy, peace, blessing, they're all in there. Difficulty, chastening, it's hard, it brings sorrow. So you, you draw this diagram, and what we're trying to do is help people see that the choices that we make every day to choose how to think, how to respond, how to live, uh, uh, how to obey or disobey, those, those choices are going to have implications. And we're trying to motivate people by the very warnings and the promises that God gives that the fight of the Spirit, warring against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit, is worth fighting. And that in order to fight it, we have to fight it at the level of our inner man, at the heart. Letting the Word of God and the Spirit of God inform our thoughts and our desires and our intentions and our motives and our goals and our choices. That's what we must do to win the fight. And so you can take this and then, what did that take? 20 minutes? Right? You walk them through it. It might take a bit longer if you're having them look things up. Right? You can also memorize all of those passages, which would be really good. I probably have about half of them memorized. Shame on me. Um, I was going to try to memorize them all. So at the top of the page, though, giving them this, uh, this kind of truism, only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. It's a little bit trite, but uh, there's, it's realistic as well. Um, pleasing God, pleasing self, not only in regards to what we do, but the attitudes we choose, the words that we say, uh, the perspective that we have on life, uh, our trials, those who sin against us, uh, etc. Um, so what is our goal in life? And that's, that's what you're, you want to get them to see. Nobody who comes to you for counseling is going to come hoping for that, right? If they're coming to see you, they're walking into a church saying, I need help. This is what they want. This is really what they want. And if they're truly saved, they, they will desire this. And so our goal is to help them see how to get there, that it's going to take some hard work below the line, hard work, learning how to live by truth, learning by principle. And you can go back to this session after session after session as they're sharing their life with you and ask simple questions that come back to this and say, do you think you were living by truth and principle there? Or were you living by feelings and desire? And you'll see it, they'll go, oh. They'll know right away, right? And they'll know why they're struggling. They'll know why they're in the dumps that week when they showed up to talk with you. 
I love Denise wrote on the bottom of her this Y chart. She said every every response to temptation is an act of worship, and it's either one of those directions, self or God, and so that just goes. Yep. And that's that's where we're going. So this is our goal. This is what we desire. Biblically, our goal in life is to please God. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether present or absent, to be pleasing to Him. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 9. And how do we please God? We please God by being like Jesus Christ. So you just walk Him through this logical uh, step, right? This is your goal, to please God. This is what you want, right? How do we do that? The Bible says we please God by being like Jesus Christ, Matthew 3, 17. This is where the Lord... God of heaven speaks at Jesus' baptism and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Man, I want him to say that about me too. How will I be confident that he would say such a thing about me? I walk as Jesus walked. I live a Christ-like life. That's what I strive for, right? And we can please God. We can. Um, so by being like Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 29 says... Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become formed to the image of his son. So he'd be the firstborn among many. Is that 29 or 28? That's 29. So uh, we can please God. Now, then you make sure they understand. God knows you're not going to be perfect. Right? This is where I think people get tripped up sometimes. Well, I'm never going to be perfect, so why should I strive for it? Uh, but God expects us to be growing. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He just expects you to be growing. That's, you, you're going to please Him if you're growing. Philippians 1.6, uh, confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. See, God's at work in you. You've got to be growing. This is what we're working toward. Uh, 2.12 and 13 is where He says, um, uh, work out your own salvation from the power of sin in this age. With fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Ephesians 4 says, in reference to your former manner of life, put off the old man which is being corrupted according to the lusts of his seat. Be renewed in spirit of your mind and put on the new man. That's what he expects of us. That's his calling to us as Christians. This process of growth and sanctification, that's the call. And so this whole thing just becomes a, a matter of a motivation for them. Because they want joy and peace and, and blessing and rest and God's favor, right? And so show them how to get there by fighting this battle below the line in the, at the level of the heart. So turn the page and you'll see what Josh was pointing us to. That sin is ultimately a, a worship disorder, as Fred has said. And again, all of this is the be who you are thing. Right? The, the, all these things. You're a new creature. Live like one. You've been set free from the law of sin of death. So enjoy that freedom. You can put on the new man, which is being renewed. This is who you are. You've been set free from sin. The old man is dead. Be who you, you are. Romans 6. Uh, listen, listen to it again. Thanks be to God. This is Romans 6, 17 through 19. I don't have that in your notes. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart, from the heart, to that standard of teaching to which you're committed. And having been set free from sin, you've become slaves of righteousness. And he says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. And he, the encouragement there, he's saying, look, I, I know this is hard to understand while you still have the flesh. Right? That's, that's all he's saying. I'm speaking in human terms. I know this is hard to stand, understand. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawless, leading to more lawlessness, no, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. See, he's just saying, just in the way you were slaves to sin, now be slaves to righteousness. That's who God has created you to be. You know what he does there in Romans 6 too, which I didn't have? He says, let me give you another motivation. Because when you weren't doing that, Life was horrible. When you were slaves from sin, what benefit were you deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. And he says, what fruit? What fruit? See, I mean, the, the scriptures do the same thing just by 
by the warning and by the promise of reward, right? By telling us there'll be chastening or there'll be favor, trying to motivate us to be who, who we are. Um, one of the ways scripture refers to the breakdown here, right here, and why Denise has, what do you have down here? Every response to temptation is an act of worship. Every response is an act of worship. Our hearts are little idol factories. There's, there's a lot of metaphors in scripture for sin, uh, idolatry or worship, uh, uh, sinful worship in, in that case is one of them. Sin is viewed as a sickness or a disease for which we need the healing power of the great physician. Sin is viewed as slavery. Paul emphasizes that one in Romans 6, from which we need redemption and the freedom that comes from Christ. There's other ways uh, sin is described in Scripture. Exchanging truth for a lie, right? That's another way sin is described. Not acknowledging God, but ignoring God. Uh, having a darkened heart or darkened understanding, walking in darkness, um, not fearing God, but loving yourself. See, these are somewhat metaphors, but they're, they communicate to us the, the essence of sin. They're all useful, and depending on the particular issue you're trying to help people think through, one might be more helpful than others. But this one, idol of the heart, seems to be uh, pretty useful and can be applied pretty generally. Um, and we probably should all have it in our, our ministry toolbox. Where do we see this metaphor of idols of the heart? Ezekiel 14. Um, uh, certain, well, let's read it. The certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me for Ezekiel. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of men, son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set a stumbling block of iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? So they basically had taken their idolatry into their hearts and they were still coming to Ezekiel wanting to hear the Lord speak to them. And God was saying, no. Their, their loyalty, their worship, is to someone else. And, uh, and he called that idolatry in their hearts. Idolatry is and always has been uh, a heart issue, even in the New Testament. Um, is it John or Peter that says greed is idolatry? Is that John? It's in there somewhere. It's in the Bible. I promise. Um, so what we worship and why we sin is driven by what we long for, what our hearts are loyal to. And that's what this metaphor does, is it reminds us how easy it is to long for and be loyal to things other than God and to make other things more important to us than the worship of God. So uh, my son is a chip off the old block. I know what it's like to be a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. Um, I learn more about my own heart trying to counsel my son through his love of pleasure uh, than I care to remember. It's safe to say that. Um, he would constantly make choices, it seemed every week, make choices directly disobeying us just because he wanted something else. Didn't matter what it was. It could have been playing a video game one week. It could have been riding his bike into town the next week. It could have been going down the hill and jumping in the river. We have no idea where he is uh, the next week. It could be one thing after another. And it always was. And we give him clear instructions, and he was like, I, I don't know. I just wanted to do it. You know, we say, why did you do that? We told you not to. I don't know. I wanted to do it. He just loved it. He just loved pleasure rather than than honoring us. So he's honoring his own desires instead of honoring his parents. And we talked to him about it this way, that you're making the pleasure you get from playing that video game or going down swimming in the creek, you're making that pleasure more important in that moment than worshiping God, than honoring God by honoring and obeying your parents. Do you see how that happens? And our, our hearts desire and long for things all the time and uh, and we need to understand that. Now, here's a great, helpful list from 
Ed Welch's little pamphlet called Why Do I Do the Things I Do. Actually, it was an article in the Journal of Biblical Counseling, but I think they turned it into a little booklet too, didn't they? Don't we have those at the church? We just have that paper. Oh, okay. And Mortals of the Heart. Yeah. And, and uh, he boils down a dozen or so motives of our heart that can control us like a little idol. Just like the, the elders of Israel, that we set these things up in our heart and they become more important to us than God. Pleasure, power, love, or interest me, comfort, meaning and purpose, control, freedom, peace, happiness, significance, reputation, respect, admiration, success. Um, all of those things are really easy to set up in our hearts and be more important to us than what honors God. So beneath the surface of all of our, our sinful desires and responses and motives and attitudes um, are things like this. And, and usually it's a combination of things, right? Probably if you've boiled someone's issues down to one uh, of these things, you're probably not digging deep enough. It's, it's usually a combination of, of things. Um, and notice that th this goes back to what we were talking about in James, where we're all drawn away and enticed by our own lust, right? So there's the idolatry, that desire, that's what lust means, it's just a desire. That desire that is our own, it's idiosyncratic to us, and we set it up in our hearts, and we're just not going to be happy if we don't get it. And it could be any number of things. So some people love pleasure. Some people love comfort. You know, laziness is a sin. Where does laziness come from? Some people just like comfort, right? So instead of being responsible and doing their job or kids doing their chores, they just want to be comfortable. So they're setting up comfort, being more important than God and more important than their duties in those moments. That's what they're doing. They're setting up comfort as an idol in their heart. It can be complicated as well. So take a drunkard. It's not hard to imagine that someone could develop a drinking or a drug problem that's motivated by comfort, right? Or motivated by pleasure. They just love the buzz. That's their deal. But some people they get there because they're, they, they want uh, freedom from pain, right? So they, they do drugs, so they drink just to numb the pain of life. And that's how many people fall into that pattern of sin. Uh, some people fall into drinking problems because they want to be autonomous. It's, it's freedom, freedom from authority that they want. So the young kid goes off to college and he decides, I'm going to party because I can. And my, my mom and my dad, they're not here to tell me I can't. And so for them, it's this asserting of authority, their autonomy, you know, and they set that up. And so they're willing to get drunk and dishonor everybody. And so you can see that the symptom, the outworking of it is the same, drunkenness. But I've just pinpointed four different possible idols that a person could set up in their heart that might lead them down that path of drunkenness, right? So as you're counseling with people, you're asking questions. Why do you do those things? What are you thinking? What are you saying to yourself? Um, and so you're trying to help them understand where that stuff comes from. Um, and until you can help, well, one, you, the best way to learn this, by the way, is to deal with all your own individual sins this way. Right? You're, you're really not going to be a good counselor unless you can do this in your own life and heart. Until you're able to ask these kinds of questions of your own heart, please don't try to do it with others. <laughs> It's not going to end well. They're going to think you're a proud uh, something or other. I don't know. It's not going to end well, right? And you're not going to be able to identify them. Uh, it's not going to come across as one beggar showing another beggar Amen. where to find the bread if you're the one that's always, and you're never identifying with them. So my, you know, my son would tell you, yeah, me and my dad, we both love pleasure. He, he'd tell you that. You know, what's, what's the most common idol in your heart? Love of pleasure. Yeah, my dad too. Chip off the old block. 
Um, it, it wouldn't be trying to be funny about it. We just know, we've had that conversation so many times. And, um, and so counseling is like that, where you've gotta to learn to deal with your own heart this way. The other thing is, and here's the next point here, a lot of times these are just good things gone bad. As you look at those motives and desires in that list, they're not all bad. I want to be loved. <laughs> Anybody here want to be loved? <laughs> I like being loved. Uh, pleasure's not bad either, right? God has given us all things richly to enjoy. Woohoo! I like that promise. It's a good one. Uh, so often it's a good thing that's gone, gone bad, right? They're, these motives and desires, they're not always idols by nature, right? They're not inherently bad. They become idols that we've set up in our heart when they take control of us, when we want them too much, when our desires for them overpower our intention and pursuit of worshiping and obeying God. Okay, so um, they only become idols when you make them more important than pleasing God. So the husband gets angry at his wife because she doesn't respect him. Like, she will not disrespect me again in public. <laughs> Makes a big scene at the church Christmas party. Right? We've all seen awkward situations like that. What's going on? Wives, see to it that you respect your husband. Right? The best thing to do when that guy yells at his wife at the church Christmas party is take her aside and say, See? You're getting away. You, everyone's like, He's not serious, is he? I hope he's not serious. <laughs> this is getting awkward really fast. <laughs> so, no, he's made a good thing, a good thing because wives should see to it that they respect their husbands. He's made it more important to himself than honoring and pleasing God because he's getting angry when he can't get it. So how do you know, right, when a legitimate desire may have become an idol? Well, if the desire itself is sinful, chalk it up. That one's easy. But it could also be a legitimate desire becomes an idol if you sin, if you can't fulfill it. So a guy isn't getting the respect he wants from his wife, and he gets angry. Now I know. That desire for respect is more important to him than humbly worshiping God when he's wronged by his wife. Right? Or if you sin in order to get it. So I want to play that video game so bad as a 14 year old boy that I'm going to disobey my dad the minute he walks out the door, turn on the Xbox, and have at it. Right? I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so that's part of what you're trying to help uh, people come to, to understand. What's difficult, um, let's see, what time is it? Two o'clock. Where are we going? Oh, awesome, I have to 2.15. <laughs> We're right on schedule. Um, a lot of the motives and desires that we listed there are uh, immaterial in nature, right? But it's, it's true that a lot of what drives us is often tied to our earthly material existence and those can become idols too. So it could be, uh, it could be tied to something like pleasure. It could be specific pleasures like sexual desire, food, right? Recreation. So, I mean, you can make the Seahawks more important to you than honoring and worshiping God. I know that's probably getting personal. He's meddling now, um, but it's possible. But, uh, you know, probably women more so than men, but not exclusively, a healthy body, a certain body shape could become an idol, right? You do crazy things to get it. That's why people end up uh, anorexic and whatnot. Having certain friends, young people, or probably middle-aged people even more, they just got to have a boyfriend. They just got to have a girlfriend or they want to have a husband or a wife, right? And they end up doing uh, things that dishonor God, deceitful things to secure that spouse. We had a lady in our church who admitted 
after the fact that she basically manipulated her husband by uh, feeding him and doing his laundry and basically being a wife to him before they ever got engaged. And she said, I did it because I thought this might be my last chance. This guy is at least friendly to me, so I'm going to treat him like a husband in hopes that he'll just kind of give in. And she basically proposed to him. And he was just, after all that, he was just naive enough to go, I don't know, why not? She's basically, and he, it worked. I mean, it literally worked. And years later, I'm counseling him because they were never really, he was never really in love with her. He just liked getting served all the time. And she did a great job at that. But he cheated on her a couple times, and that was part of the reason why. He was never really committed to it. He just liked being served all the time. This was an ugly situation. That's going great, by the way. That was, that was one of the success stories, that couple. Um, the other thing that's difficult is actually getting to the heart issue. Um, you often have to help people understand how this works because people like to talk about everything above the line. There's all kinds of things going on in our lives above the line, okay? And people love to talk about stuff that's going on above the line. And that's where things like our circumstances, material things, outward pressures, etc. people want to talk about or even blame their parents, their past, their circumstances, their relationships, their physical ailments, or their perceived ailments, or even just default to the ever popular, it's just the way I am. Right? You'll, you do any counseling for any length of time, you'll, you'll hear that one. So part of your job is to, just through helpful, loving questions and conversation, try to figure out where in that possible list their desires and motivations are coming, help them understand the ruminations of the heart, how all these pieces work to issue forth in what's going on in their life. People who like to talk about their circumstances or their pressures or their past um, need to understand, and here's the teabag illustration I promised I would come back to. Our hearts are like teabags, okay? And what we do with teabags is we dip them in hot water and whatever is in there comes out. And our circumstances and our past, the people around us are like that hot water. You cannot blame the hot water for what is in the tea bag, right? What is in the tea bag is, the, is you. It's the you that's either being influenced by this and making those choices, or it's the you that's being influenced by this, being renewed and making these choices. What's in the tea bag isn't caused by the hot water. So they want to talk about stuff above the line. We need to help them understand what's in their heart. Um, and when we do that, then we're helping them understand what they really think, what they're really desiring in those moments, what they're craving, what they're adoring, and based on what they're choosing, what they're worshiping, right? Because all of these choices are a decision about who or what you're going to worship. Questions? I've got couple thoughts I'd like to, I'd like to just yeah. share and you've touched on them but Ezekiel 14 read through that sometime and and see how God describes it because he talks about multiple idols that they've set up in their heart oftentimes people have more than one and Brian said that but he also calls them a stumbling block that they set before their face a stumbling block of iniquity sometimes it's easier for us to see somebody else's idol than it is for us to see our own and, and that's probably more true than not, that other people can see our pride or our selfishness or our lack of humility or whatever it is better than we can. So, so you can help, you can help your counselee see those things that have just become a natural way of living for him. So you know, just read through that carefully and, and it describes that God's going to turn his face against these people if they keep these idols before they're their eyes and they're blinded by them because because they are worshiping something else rather than God just like Brian said another verse that I like a lot that I would probably add to that chart is um, Luke 6 
Verse 45 says, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The, the scripture seemed to picture, as Brian has here, that the heart's like a reservoir that holds a treasure. And it's all those influences of the scripture or, or whatever it is you're looking to for information and source of truth that puts the good treasure or a bad treasure in your heart. So as Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart with all vigilance out of it flow the issues of life you know and it's it's just helpful to think of that everything below that line is a treasure is it a good treasure or is it a bad treasure and what are you viewing what are you reading what are you telling yourself what are you listening to that's putting that treasure in your heart guard that with all vigilance those two questions, Brian, what do I want so badly and willing to sin to get? Is that written down? Uh, yeah, it's in their notes. Okay. Well, it's not written quite that way, but a desire has become an idol when you sin if you can't have it or you sin in order to get it. So what am I wanting? Those are two good questions. Yeah. What do I want so badly I'm willing to sin to get? Or what do I want so badly that I'll, I'll sin if I don't get it? There's, there's a book that Denise doesn't have up here written by a man named Brad Bigney called Gospel Treason that, that addresses idols of the heart very well. And you know, He talks about um, sometimes, sometimes it can be exposed by where you spend your time, you know, where you spend your money, the things you were thinking about constantly. It's, it's a real challenge. Relationships? Yeah, and the relationships you keep. And, and you, you can find examples of scripture. I mentioned last night, I mentioned Ananias. Or maybe, it's, no, it's today we're talking about the spirit. Ananias lied to the spirit. What did Ananias want? He wanted the approval of man, apparently, more than he wanted to please God. So he lied about the proceeds from the selling of his land to get the approval of the apostle Peter. And that's a big thing. Some of us can be man pleasers rather than God pleasers. That article by Ed Welch, Motives of the Heart, is that in here? Because if it isn't, Josh and Jim, uh, Joe, you have it in your manual from class. You want to run copies of it. Okay, yeah, I can get it. So I, I often in a counseling session will ask people, what do you think would make your life happy? Or satisfying. So I, I don't usually ask it quite like, "What do you want so bad you're not willing? You're willing to sin to get it?" Because you're kind of playing your cards at that point. So I'll ask it a little more subtly. What do you think would need to happen for you to be truly satisfied in life? And you, I mean, if you if you're having a loving, helpful conversation, you ask that question. You're gonna you're gonna hear what's in there. <laughs> It'll, it'll start to come out, and you ask follow-up questions. Uh, what do you hear most? Uh, I don't know if I would say I hear one thing most. I hear a lot of things, you know. Um, if my wife would just respect me. Um, in marriage counseling, I hear that one. Uh, but it's, I don't know if I hear one thing more than anything. Yeah. John Calvin says our heart is an idle factory. You know, and about the time you put one to death, another one's going to pop up because, because we live in a fallen world. And you can take a question like Brian's suggesting for these people. You can ask them that, or you can write it out. Let them take it home and contemplate it a little bit. Let them, you know, think about it and give, give it to them as homework. There's good questions that you can get them to really be a little bit introspective, you know, to, to really think about what is it I want out of life? What is it that's been driving me? Questions? If you don't have questions, we're going to go outside and run around the church three times. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, we're right on schedule. So let's uh, let's take a 15-minute break, and we'll be back in 15 we'll, we'll, minutes. We'll finish before Jim.